Our scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. Let us all read together. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts. It is perhaps the boldest petition in the Lord's Prayer. It is perhaps the boldest request in the Bible. It is perhaps the boldest request that we can ever make in our lives. Our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts. Perhaps it's only rivaled by the book of Ephesians in 3.18 where it asks that we may be filled up to the measure of all the fullness of God. It is the only petition in the Lord's Prayer that is singled out for further elaboration by Jesus Christ. In verses 14 and 15 of the same chapter we read, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. Sin, debt. The word we read today as debt, in some translations, is translated differently. It's sometimes translated as sins. It's sometimes translated as forgive us the wrongs we have done. It's sometimes translated as Forgive us our transgressions. When I was a young boy in elementary school, I went to a Christian school. My family weren't Christian, but I was sent to the local school. It was a Church of England school. Every now and again, particularly at Easter and Christmas, we were sent by our teacher to go to church. I remember one time the reverend stood up and read the Lord's Prayer. And he said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I was a young boy, only grade one. I had no idea what the full meaning of trespasses meant. The only way I'd experienced this word is when I ran across farms, across the signs that said private property, no trespassing. And here was this reverend standing up and saying, forgive us our trespasses. As I kneeled down and put my hands together, looking up at this reverend, I remember wondering, what part of God's land I had accidentally trodden on. I had absolutely no idea the full meaning of this word. Now the word debt is a word with a wide range of meanings actually, but they're all grouped around one common idea. William Barclay <coughs> helps us out. He says, the word debt always means something that is owed. The word debt always means something that is due. It's something that is a duty or obligation to pay or give that hasn't been paid or given. The word is borrowed from the world of business, from the world of commerce, and in its narrowest meaning, and this is the meaning we find in today's verse, it actually means a financial debt, a financial debt, a debt to do with money. Similarly, the word, also, the word forgive also comes from the world of commerce, the world of business. And its literal meaning is to erase from the financial accounts every failure of obligation. It, it literally means to raise the numbers of a business account, to erase the numbers on a business ledger. So where are we? 
let me give you a very literal rendering of today's verse. Father, forgive us our debts. Father, erase from the financial accounts every failure of obligation to you and our fellow human beings. It sounds pretty complicated, doesn't it? This talk of numbers and accounts. But this language of erasing finances and numbers is worth looking at more because it's the same language Jesus, is, Jesus uses often when he's talking about debt and forgiveness. Peter approaches uh, Jesus and asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone? Up to seven times? In Peter's mind, maybe he's being very generous. Seven times, it's a number of com perfection, completion. It's a, it's a big number. We often struggle to forgive people once. And Jesus says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. To understand this a little bit more, we have to go back all the way back to the Old Testament to a guy called Lamech. Lamech had been um, insulted somehow by a young man and he sings a song and the last words of this song is, um, Cain has been, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77. If Cain has been avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Jesus keeps this number 77. But instead of 77 times revenge, he talks of 77 times forgiveness. And this is what Jesus came to effect in our hearts, the natural human tendency towards revenge, towards anger, towards unforgiveness, is affected and changed in the human heart by the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we do pray, Father in heaven, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. But then we have to ask ourselves, what is the debt that we owe? What is the debt that we owe? We accepted Christ. We confessed with our mouth and believed in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. What is it that we owe? In a word, obedience. The obedience coming from faith. We owe God our complete obedience, and we fall short. In Romans 1.5, we read this. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And in Romans 16.26, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. We are all in debt because of our failure to pay full obedience. We are in debt because we fall short of God's kingdom ideals for us. We are in debt because as Christians, we fail to live the ideals, the Christian ideals, the kingdom ideals that we should actually be ambassadors of. sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? But I think when preaching this verse, we have to focus on what our debt is. In order for this verse to transform our hearts in the image of Christ, we have to understand how heavy our debt is. In order for this verse to be fruitful, I believe we have to be honest with ourselves. When was the last time we sat down and meditated on our lack of obedience. If you've done that this year, then you are doing better than me. So in order to feel the true weight of our debt, let's go to the Ten Commandments first. God said to Moses, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Let me paraphrase. I am the lover, you are the beloved. You will not let anything, not just religion, but anything, your money, your education, your job, your aspirations, your goals, you will not let any of these earthly desires come between me and my love for you. You can see how we're falling short. Let's go to the last 
Let's go to the last commandment. You shall not covet. You shall not cover your neighbor's husband. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife. You shall not cover your neighbor's apartment. You shall not cover your neighbor's job or your neighbor's education or your neighbor's beautiful appearance or your neighbor's Mercedes Benz. You can see how we're falling short. Or let us go straight to the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that people were told in the past, do not commit murder. Anyone who does will be brought to trial. But now I tell you, if you are angry with your brother, you will be brought to trial. If you call your brother, you good for nothing, you will be brought before the council. If you call your brother a worthless fool, you will be in danger of going to the fire of hell. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. You have heard it th that it was said, love your friends, hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may become the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Are we feeling the debt? Have you ever done this before, truly meditated on your debt and how we are falling short of our kingdom ideals? An early Christian uh, theologian called Origen wrote about this. He said the debt we owe is threefold. We owe a debt to our fellow human beings, to our parents, to children, to strangers, to the poor, to the widows, to the aged, to those in authority, to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love each other as Jesus loves us. We also owe a debt to ourselves, to our body. As believers, our body houses his Holy Spirit. We are to treat our body as holy and not abuse it. And we also owe a debt to God to love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. To give all our anxieties up to him. To all our needs up to him. Origen says that there is not a minute that goes by and day and night that we are not constantly in debt to our Lord. When I was a child, I heard a story about a man who tried to fly to the sun. I was a very imaginative child. Every night before I went to sleep, I too imagined myself flying to the sun. I had no idea of what the atmosphere was. So in my mind's eye, I would fly to the sun and the sun would just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it would get hotter and hotter and hotter until I was completely consumed and then I fell back down to earth. Meditating on our debt, on our lack of obedience is a little bit like that. It's a little bit like flying to the sun. The more we meditate on it, the more we think about it, the more it consumes us. Let's pray for a short time. Our Father, forgive us our debts. Wipe our accounts clean. Father in heaven, creator and judge, forgive us our debts. Cancel all of them. The debts we owe to others. The debts we owe to ourselves. The debts we owe to you. Cancel our debts. We realize we've fallen short of our obligations, Lord. We realize we've failed your vision for us of kingdom living. Father, we know that you seek to continue your closeness to us, to live with us every day and night, Lord. And we've, we're so sorry that we've failed in our obligations, Lord. But we thank you. We thank you for your patience with us, Lord. We thank you for your, for your forgiveness, Lord. We pray for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And he does. He does. He does forgive us. For anyone who has confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, we are forgiven. Our relationship continues. Our closeness continues. God does persevere despite our failure. Let me quote Augustine's favorite verse. It's from Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, 
and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Just like that? Just like that? Does he do it that easily? Can you imagine me going to my bank, talking to my bank manager and saying, hey, Bob, you know that um, Maserati I bought last year? And the bank manager says, yeah, that's right, Pete. You've only paid a few dollars of that debt. You still owe me a whole bunch more. And so I say, yeah, well, you know, how about you just erase that ledger? How about you just wipe it clean? And he says, you know what, Pete? Sure, I'll do that for you. No problem. It's a beautiful day. I will erase that financial debt, and I will send you a letter of confirmation in the post. Go in peace, my brother. Is that going to happen? No way. No way. It's a tremendous debt. It's a titanic debt that we owe. It's a debt so large that all the prayers in the world couldn't pardon us. All the work in the world by itself couldn't do justice to the gravity of the debt. It came at a heavy cost that no one could pay. The establishment, the beginning of this relationship came at a cost. It came at a price that nobody could pay. Nobody except one. No one except the Son of God. No one except the Son of Christ. Because in Psalm 103, verses 10 and 11, we read, He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, I love that analogy, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. A titanic debt, yes. A debt we cannot pay ourselves, yes. A debt that we owe to others, to ourselves, and to God, absolutely. A spiritual mortgage that we can never pay, absolutely. A debt that all your hard work and good deeds by themselves can never pay off. Absolutely. A debt that came at no cost. A debt that came at no cost. Absolutely not. Jesus Christ pays the cost himself. He pays the price not with diamonds or with gold or with land. But he pays it in the only way that the Old Testament foretold, the only way that would work, the only pure, sinless offering with his own blood on the cross. That is how our relationship with Christ started. That was our salvation. And yet we still need to pray for forgiveness. We still need to realize that we've fallen short. Colossians 2, 13, 14 writes, you were at one time spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were Gentiles without the law. But God has now brought you to life with Christ. God forgave all of us our sins. He canceled the unfavorable record of our debts with its binding rules and did away with it completely by nailing it to the cross. The boldest prayer we can ever pray is answered because the one who teaches us to pray pays the debt himself. One Christian writer put it this way. He came to pay a debt he didn't owe. Because we owe a debt we couldn't pay. And now for the second part. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Rabbi Gamaliel, who for so long the Apostle Paul sat at the feet of before he gave his life to Christ, said, so long as you are merciful, God will have mercy upon you. If you are not merciful, he will not be merciful to you. And it does seem that also Jesus himself makes our forgiveness, our forgiveness for our failure of obedience, contingent upon our willingness to forgive. Jesus himself points to the necessary fact that we have to forgive we have to be forgiving people in order to maintain that relationship, that closeness that God desires, that closeness of relationship which God desires. 
Daryl Johnson makes a great observation and one that I believe will, will resonate with us today. He says that if we are not willing to forgive other people, we are not truly praying this prayer. If we are not willing to truly forgive other people, we are not truly praying this prayer. He helps us by using three words. Justice, mercy, and grace. Justice is God giving me what I deserve. Mercy is God not giving me what I deserve. And grace is God giving me what I do not deserve. And when we pray this prayer, when we pray this, this verse in the Lord's Prayer, when we pray it with our hearts and pray it authentically, we are not asking for justice. We pray that God, you are all-powerful, you are my creator and loving God, and you are also a just God. But we ask for mercy. We ask that God withholds his justice from us. Not only that, but we also pray for grace. We also pray that God gives us what we do not deserve. Relationship with him. His spirit, his indwelling spirit in our hearts and minds every day and night. So when we pray this prayer authentically, we are not praying for justice, but we are praying for mercy and we are praying for grace. And what happens when we do not forgive other people? Exactly the opposite. We're actually asking for justice. We don't wish for them that they have the closeness and the relationship with God that we do. We want them to suffer. We want vengeance. We want them to be in pain. We don't want God to extend the mercy and the graces that he extends to us. In our heart of hearts, we do not want to ex God to extend that to them. Martin Luther said, to actually be unforgiving and pray this prayer is a sin. To be unforgiving and to pray this prayer is a sin, according to Martin Luther. And I think Daryl Johnson helps us with these three words. Understand that our heart cannot be in these two modes. We cannot wish for ourselves what we do not wish for other people, for those who have hurt us, and pray this prayer authentically. We cannot. The human heart cannot stand before God in these two very different modes. We are in no way praying the Lord's Prayer when we do this. The British preacher John Stott says it best. God forgives only the penitent. And one of the chief evidences of true penitence is a forgiving heart. Is it difficult? Yes. Do we struggle as Christians with forgiveness? Yes. But we affirm ourselves in the grace of God. We affirm ourselves in the grace of God. Through the grace, we have the strength to forgive others. Through his grace, we have the knowledge that that relationship we share with God must be shared with other people if we are to pray this prayer. Difficult, yes, but do it, we, we must. Do it, we must. To forgive is to set someone free and find out that that person you're setting free is yourself. Because you are free, free to forgive, free to pray this prayer with full integrity and full honesty and free to become more like God. What I want us today is to leave this place with the knowledge in our hearts and minds that we are praying this prayer with full integrity. I would like to lead us all in a short exercise of forgiveness. So if you will, I'd like you to bow your heads and I'd like you to close your eyes. And if you feel the Spirit is calling you 
Not me, not Grace Baptist Church, not Pastor Doug or Pastor Nick, but if you feel the Spirit is calling you to forgive someone that you have been so far unable to forgive, I would like to invite you to do this exercise with me right now. With your eyes closed, I would like you to go to the Father in prayer and tell the Father his or her name. Tell the Father what he or she did to you that hurt you so much. Now tell the Father what you would like done to him or her and be honest. Don't hold back because the Father knows what's in your heart. Now imagine yourself at the bottom of the hill. On top is Jesus on the cross. He invites you up. Talk to him. Share your hurt. Share your anger. Look Jesus in the eyes and tell him how difficult it is to forgive. Now, as an act of your own free will, as the Spirit moves you, go down the hill to that person that hurt you. And lead that person up to the feet of Jesus. As an act of your free will, look at Jesus and point to that person and say these words. Give this person what you have given me. I desire that this person has the same loving relationship, the same grace-filled relationship with you as I do. And now hear Jesus say this, I will. Blessed are you. You are never more like me and my Father than when you forgive. Go in peace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. We are going to have a song of invitation now. We invite you to the front. Pastor Nick, Pastor Doug, our sister Gina will be here. If the Spirit moves you and you wish to pray, we will be here to pray with you. Thank you.